Our opening sentence is, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Our processional hymn this morning is hymn, Teach Me My God and King, hymn 496. Just a brief introduction, I'd like to welcome you all to St. Stephen's for worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Russell Wall and I'm a lay reader here at St. Stephen's Anglican Church and I'll be leading the service this Sunday and since our summer student is now done for the summer, um, we will have lay readers and I think Bev doing communion services for the next several months. So um, I'd just like to take a moment to thank everybody who's helping Put this service together this morning the sound people at the back amy on music i think Lo lois is doing vocals so um i just like to to kind of thank everybody for for all they've done to to make this service possible so let us begin dearly beloved brethren the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace. And we will say the general confession together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done and there is no help in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name, amen. Almighty Father, who of thy great love to men didst give thy dearly beloved Son to die for us, grant that through his cross our sins may be put away and remembered no more against us, and that cleansed by his blood and mindful of his sufferings, we may take up our cross daily and follow him in newness of life, until we come to his everlasting kingdom, through the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make speed to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. We will now have hymn 334, Holy God, we praise your name. Sit for our first lesson. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law, Jethro, the priest of Midiah, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared in him 
in a flame of fire out of the of bush. He looked and with at the he looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out from the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place you on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites have now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress him. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that it is who I sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has said to me, sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall go to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord and God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Here endeth the first lesson. Our song today is Psalm 105, and we will sing as we have been doing in the past. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. And speak of
The second reading is found in Romans 12, verse 9 to 21, a reading from the book of Romans. Let love be, a, be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast what is good, love one another with mutual affection, undo one another with show, showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be a hardened in spirit, Serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, preserve in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, bless those who persecute you, bless those who do not curse them, rejoice those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never average yourselves. But leave room from the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here ended the second lesson. Our gradual hymn this morning is, Will You Come and Follow Me, hymn 430. Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is written in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at the 21st verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes 
and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We will now say the Benedictus together. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, and from the hands of all that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham, that he would grant us, that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. If everyone please be seated, and I'd like to invite all the kids to come forward. How are you guys doing today? Good. So, y'all excited to go back to school on Tuesday? No. <laughs> you can you can ask me if I'm excited to go back to work on Tuesday. I, I, I kind of know it's waiting for me, and Tuesday is going to be a really busy day. So, so I'm maybe a little bit too that I'm not quite looking forward to going back to work, but I will. To kindergarten. Good for you. You are. Oh, wow. You guys are doing really well. Grade two. Mm, wow. Four. And what? Six. Five. Two. And what about Toledo? Five. Wow. That's a lot of numbers to remember. You're five, two. 
Okay, now you guys got to listen. I got a little story I want to talk to you about today. First of all, I want to ask you if you've ever heard the saying, help yourself. Help yourself. Help yourself. So you're sitting at the supper table and there's a big plate of broccoli and you would love to have some seconds of broccoli. And so you ask your mom or your dad, can I have some more broccoli? And they say, help yourself. Or maybe I should say there's a big piece of extra dessert sitting on the table and you, you would like that, yeah, instead of the broccoli and you ask them and what did they say? Sometimes if you're really lucky, help yourself. Help yourself. There's another adult saying I want to talk to you guys about today, and it's a saying that some people sometimes say, and they say, I'm looking out for number one. Now, you've probably never heard that saying before. Any ideas of what that would mean? If I say, I'm looking out for number one. No, you're not in a race. Um, we, we, the big cherries. No, I don't know if that's it either. If I say I'm looking up for number one, that means all I'm concerned about is me. I don't care about anybody else around me. All I'm worried about is myself, that I get what I want, and that's all that matters. So today's gospel reading, did you guys listen to it? Yes. And do you think that, Jesus maybe had something to say about the saying, I'm just looking out for number one. So today they were heading to Jerusalem and Jesus told his disciples what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. What was going to happen to Jesus? He was going to die on the cross and then three days later he arrived. Exactly. And what did one of his main disciples say to that? Yeah, basically, he said, no, that's not going to happen. In fact, his exact words from Peter were, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. And then what did Jesus say to Peter? He actually called him a name. You guys remember? You want me to read it again? Yeah. So he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Was that very nice of Jesus to do? No. Well, actually, Jesus did that for a very good reason. Because, well, and Jesus says, he says, Peter, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So what do you think Jesus meant by that? You're setting your mind on divine things, not on divine things, but you're setting your mind on human things. Any ideas? He doesn't, want Jesus to die. he doesn't want Jesus to die. But what what Peter is doing is he's thinking about what he wants, not what God wants or divine things. And what Peter was probably in the back of his mind thinking, if Jesus goes to Jerusalem and they're going to kill him, and I'm one of his followers, What's going to happen to me? Kill you. Yeah, exactly. So who was Peter looking out for, really? Him. Himself. Peter was looking out for number one. So that's the most valuable lesson that we can learn in today's gospel reading. What's that? Yeah, he, well, that's what Peter was scared of, I think, that he would die with him. And so and then Jesus goes on to say that those who save their life will lose it, and those who lose, um, give their life for my sake will gain it. And I think what Jesus meant with that is, is that it's not important that we look out after just ourselves. Jesus' call in all of our lives here today and all around the world is that we're not so much worried about ourselves, but we help people around us. And we care for people around us. We treat them kindly. We treat them with respect, no matter who they are or how much money they have or how little money they have. Um, Jesus wants us to treat everybody better than we almost treat ourselves. And that's what he wants us to do. And I think since this is the beginning of the school year coming up, 
that is something really important for you guys to learn in the upcoming school year. If there ever comes a time where somebody maybe seems lonely or picked on or on their own, you could say to yourself, what can I do to make them feel better? And I think that is exactly what, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what Jesus would want us to do is, is help people and be more concerned with people around us than ourselves. You have a question? Um, or you're just going to tell me something? That's right. That's what Jesus told them. But Peter still didn't want it to happen. I don't think Peter comprehended what exactly Jesus meant when he said he had to go to Jerusalem, suffer, die on the cross, and after the third day be raised again. And I, a lot of people still to this day can't figure it out. So I think Peter was really, he didn't understand. And he was more concerned about himself. And Jesus's message was, no, Peter, don't be concerned about yourself. Be concerned about God wants you to do in this world. That's what's important. Great. So there's no Sunday school today, you guys. So I think you can go back to your pews. And I got a quick short sermon, and then we'll carry on with our service. Thanks for coming. So this morning's sermon is written and presented by a Jim Somerville, who is a pastor or was a pastor in North Carolina in the United States. And the sermon this morning is entitled, From Solid Rock to Stumbling Block. And so Jim writes, the church I served in North Carolina was right on the edge of a college campus. And for nearly seven years, in addition to my work as a pastor, I set out each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning to walk across the quad, climb the front steps of the Burris building, and enter a classroom on the second floor to try and teach religion to college freshmen. Try is the operative word, I say. I'm not sure how much they learned, but I learned plenty. And one of the things I learned is that when you are teaching religion to freshmen, even at a Baptist college, you can't take anything for granted. You can't assume that they know when the Babylonian exile occurred, or that they understand the inter interdependence of the synoptic gospels, or that they can explain the hypostatic union of the Trinity. You just can't. I remember standing in front of the class a few weeks into my first semester and saying, ladies and gentlemen, this is a Bible. The first two thirds of it, more or less, is Old Testament. And the remaining third is New Testament. Got it? When we were studying the New Testament that semester, and specifically the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we had been talking about major and minor characters and their relationship to Jesus. At one point, I drew a large circle on the board and wrote Jesus' name at the center of the circle. Now, I said, based on your understanding of these characters, who is inside that circle with Jesus? And they began to offer up some guesses. John the Baptist. Jesus' mother, Mary, the disciples. I wrote those names inside the circle and then said, okay, and who would be outside the circle? And they said, Pontius Pilate, the scribes and the Pharisees, the devil. And I wrote those names on the board outside the circle with the devil's name way, way, way outside the circle. And then I ask this question, what's the difference? What puts some of these characters inside the circle where Jesus is and others outside the circle where he is not? And they shrugged their shoulders as if they didn't know. But I think if Peter had been in my class, 
he would have raised his hand. That's the thing about Peter. He was always raising his hand. When Jesus asked, who wants to be my disciple? There was Peter with his hand up. When Jesus asked, who wants to walk on water? There was Peter, hand up, waving it. And Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? There was Peter, hand up, waving crazily this time. Oh, 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 I know the answer to that. You are the Christ, he said, the son of the living God. And Jesus gave him the look that every teacher's pet lives for and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It was Peter's proudest moment. He was right there at the center of the circle, standing beside Jesus. But six verses later, as he is, but six verses later, he is as far away from the circle as anyone can be. Get behind me, Satan those words that we had in our kids' talk. And you have to wonder, what happened? The answer is in our gospel reading for today. Matthew tells us that from that moment on, from the moment Jesus blessed Peter and told him he was the solid rock on which the church would be built, he began to tell his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. It probably didn't make any sense to them, but especially not to Peter, who had just told Jesus he was the Christ, the son of the living God. The word Christ, of course, is the Greek equivalent of Messiah, a Hebrew word that means literally the anointed one. Do you remember when Samuel anointed David as king over Israel by pouring oil on his head? In that moment, David became an anointed one, a Messiah, a Christ with a small c. And ever since the time of David, Israel had been waiting for one of his ancestors to sit on his throne and save them from their enemies and to make Israel great again. Peter thought Jesus was that person. You are the Christ, he said. And then he went on and said one better. You are the son of the living God. Instead of brushing the compliment aside, as we often do, instead of saying, oh, thank you, Peter, that's very flattering, Jesus says, yes, that's it. You got it, Peter. Now let me tell you what it means to be God's one and only anointed one. It means going to Jerusalem where I will suffer and die. And the disciples are shocked. It is so completely opposite to anything they have ever heard about the Messiah that they stop in their tracks and stare. The Messiah wasn't supposed to suffer and die. He was supposed to conquer and rule. He was supposed to run the Romans out of Israel, climb the throne of his ancestor David, bring Israel into a whole new era of peace and prosperity. I'm not surprised that Peter says, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But that's when Jesus whirls around and says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on divine things, but on human things. And there it is, 
the answer. What flung Peter from the inner circle to the farthest extreme was his thinking. He wasn't thinking the things of God. He was thinking the things of men. And for a week now, I've been trying to think what the difference is. It seems to come down to this, that while our thoughts are frequently self-centered, God's thoughts are always other-centered. And while our ways are often self-serving, God's ways are always self-giving. In other words, it's in God's nature to give himself away for the sake of others and our way to save ourselves at any cost, which means that Isaiah was right about us. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither are his ways our ways, but they are the thoughts and the ways of Jesus. When Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus begins to explain what that really means. To be the son of God is to share God's nature. It is to give yourself away for the sake of others. But when Jesus begins to describe how that will happen through his suffering and death in Jerusalem, Peter shudders and says, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter said it partly, I think, because he was Jesus's right-hand man. And if Jesus were crowned king over Israel, there would certainly be a place for Peter in his cabinet. But he said it mostly, I think, because he was a human being. And like the rest of us, he was programmed for self-preservation. When Jesus said he was going to be arrested, tried, and crucified, Peter swore that he would die with him. But when a servant girl asked him later if he was one of Jesus' disciples, he swore that he wasn't. Why did he do it? Probably because he was simply afraid. He was afraid that what was happening to Jesus would happen to him too. And that if he admitted he was one of Jesus' disciples, he would end up on a cross right beside him. It isn't in our nature to give ourselves away for the sake of others. It's in our nature to protect ourselves, to preserve our lives. Once again, Peter was thinking the things of men, and the result that was that instead of standing with Jesus in the hour of his greatest need, Peter ran from the courtyard, weeping, and as far from the center of the circle as he had ever been. I think this is why Jesus says on the road near Caesare Philippi that if anyone wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, if you want to come join me at the center of this circle, you have to stop thinking the things of people and start thinking the things of God. You have to stop wondering how you can protect yourself and preserve your life. You have to start thinking instead, how can you give yourself away for God's sake and for the sake of others? And this is where I think the genius of Jesus's teaching becomes apparent. If what keeps us from thinking the things of God is our fear of death, then let's face that fear head on. Let's pick up a cross. Let's volunteer to die. And then let's follow Jesus to Jerusalem and dare anybody to stop us. Because 
hears the truth. If you give your life away, then nobody can take it from you. Jesus knew that. That's what he was thinking. And when Peter tried to get him to think differently, he said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. I am on my way to Jerusalem, and no one, not even you, Peter, is going to stop me. This is radical thinking, and I have to say, it isn't very popular. You can find preachers who will tell you how to have your best life now. You can find preachers who will give you eight steps to create the life you want. You can find preachers who will tell you how to live a life without limits. And as you might imagine, those preachers are enormously popular. People pack stadiums to hear that kind of message. But then along comes Jesus saying, those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And that's when the stadiums begin to empty out. It's not a very popular message, but maybe it's only because so few people have really ever tried it. I wonder how my life would be different, how your life would be different, if we decided today that we were going to stop thinking the things of men and start thinking the things of God. If we decided, in other words, that we were going to start giving ourselves away for God's sake and for the sake of others. If Peter were here, he would raise his hand once again and say, I can tell you the answer to that question because I've done it both ways. I've thought the thoughts of men. I've tried to save my own life. I've trembled at the fear of death, but something happened to me on that first Easter. When I saw the risen Lord, I realized that death had been defeated. I didn't have to be afraid anymore. If God could raise Jesus, he could raise me too. And so on the day of Pentecost, I stood before a crowd in Jerusalem and told them that they were the ones who had killed the Son of God. I could hardly believe I said it. They might have taken offense. They might have killed me too. But for whatever reason, I didn't care anymore. I almost dared them to do it. And for the first time in my life, I had the courage to say everything on my mind. And believe me, there was plenty I told those people all about Jesus. I told them what they had done to him was wrong. I told them they needed to do something to set things right. I told them they needed to repent and be baptized. And you know what it was like? It was like I was a different person. Like that old fearful Peter, the one who denied Jesus, was dead and gone. Like a caterpillar had crawled into a cocoon and a butterfly had come out like I had lost my old life, but found a new one to put in its place. It was the most incredible thing in the world. I felt like I could fly, and that's what I remembered, what Jesus said on the road near Caesare Philippi. Those who want to save their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake We'll find it. Amen.
Our service this morning will now continue as we sing the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into death. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the King. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thy inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, may clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us in all goodness. And of your great mercy, keep us in the same through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 466. 
How clear is our vocation, Lord. Please stand. Please sit or kneel for prayers as is most comfortable or appropriate for you. Almighty God, the foundation of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless our sovereign, King Charles III, the parliaments of the Commonwealth, and all who are set in authority under him, that they may order all things in wisdom, righteousness, and peace to the honor of thy holy name and the good of thy church and people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and clergy and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. This morning, especially, we pray for our companion diocese, for the bishops clergy, and congregations in the Diocese of Mayinga and Litchfield. We also pray for our ecumenical partners in the Lutheran, Anglican, the Ukrainian Catholic, and the Roman Catholic Covenant. We pray, grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ, Amen.
O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for the good estate of the Catholic Church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in the righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate. This morning, we pray especially for those who have asked for our prayers. We pray for Marion, Glenn, Peter. We pray for Agatha, Ashton. We pray for Ryan, Wyatt, and Jerry. And we pray for those whom we hold close in our own hearts and those who are only known to yourself. We pray, Lord, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thy unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, before our recessional hymn. Um, so the names are up on the screen now. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank Lois for vocalist. She was not the sides person. Alec was the sides person today, so thanks, Alex. And um, I have a big thank you to our readers who did a fantastic job. <laughs> You guys had some tough first and second lessons. There was a lot of hard names in there, and you did really well. So thank you very much. Um, on sound is Isaiah, not Travis. And as I say, Alex is doing a size person and also doing the PowerPoint, I think. so. And uh, thanks, Amy, for playing so wonderfully, as usual. And also on Ultra Guild, Donna and Bev. And I think I see Donna here today, so thank you very much for that. So I think that's all the, the people we have to thank for bringing 
the service for us. And um, I think we also need to thank everybody who came and everybody who joined us on Zoom this morning. On the last long weekend of September, I'm sure everybody could think of a zillion better things to do than come to worship God, but this is important too. Uh, so upcoming services next Sunday is um, BAS Holy Eucharist with Bev. She was here. I don't see her now. She disappeared. She's gone to got coffee ready already, so bless her. Um, and also next Sunday is uh, Welcome Back Sunday and first day of Sunday school. So um, all the kids are invited to bring their backpacks to this service for a blessing. So if you guys want to bring your school backpacks, um, that would be wonderful. And that'll take place next Sunday. Um, there's a rectory update. I won't go through all the things that are needed because it's probably at the back and it'll be online. Um, or should I mention it? No, just okay. There's, there's stuff that still is needed for the rectory. So if there's anything on that list that you can provide or know where you can track something down, uh, that would be great. And it says contact Val, who's here today. So if you have any of those items, just get in touch with Val. Um, I think... That is it. Um, yes. Oh, did everybody hear that? Maybe for those who didn't, because the microphone isn't on and it's on me. So next Sunday, potluck hamburgers. Welcome back Sunday. So um, that would be wonderful. Sounds great. Okay, so be, uh, people want to bring sides or desserts. Hamburgers are being provided, then I take it? Okay, so hamburgers provided, um, bring sides or desserts, or both. And um, yeah, bring lots of desserts. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, before we go over one very important announcement, the altar flowers. The flowers are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Hugh and Gloria Robinson by the Mulder and Robinson families. And for those wondering, Gloria played church organ here for years. So um, I'm sure a lot of you fond memories of Gloria and all the, all the time she played um, organ in our church. So that's who the, the altar flowers are given in memory of this morning. That's it. Anybody else have anything else? Val has something. You're going to come up? Okay, good. Great, thanks a lot for that, Val. And I think that just caps off today's um, gospel reading, kids talk and sermon perfectly of going out and, and thinking of others before yourself and those who are in need. Um, yeah, that's um, a good way to end. So um, that's it for our service today. Our processional hymn is, there, there it is, take, oh, Take up your cross, the Savior said, hymn 431, and uh, please stand.
verse 3, pick up your cross, nor hatred. Pick up your cross, nor heed the shame, and let your foolish pride be still. Your Lord for you endured the die upon a cross on Calvary's hill. Take up Go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.